Uh, we're back in Hebrews, the Hall of Faith, verses 30 and 31 today. Let me tell you a story. It was 1940, the month of May, when the Third Reich rolled into the Netherlands. And within a short seven months, all were required to obtain an identity card. However, if you were of Jewish descent, there was a J put on your identity card. A short 17 months later, it wasn't enough. And you had to start wearing on your clothing a large six-pointed yellow Star of David with the word Jew on it. I don't have to tell you the rest of the story. Relocation and death camps. But one Dutch woman, Cornelia Ten Boom, saw what was coming. She and her family quickly joined the Dutch underground and sought to protect the Jews. The underground came into her home, snuck in at her request, and built a secret tiny room. They also set up an illegal secret telephone. And through these two tools, along with the family, were able to be part of a network to move Jews throughout the countryside and save many a life. The secret room was actually in her daughter's room, Corey's room. And it became crucial that she understand not only what they were doing, but that she would seek to protect the innocent because the Gestapo would make night raids. And so she had to learn how to protect this lifeline, and she had to learn to practice to protect her responses. And so even though she was a young girl, they would practice. And in the middle of the night, they would be banging on their door. Someone would burst into her room, shine a flashlight in her face, and say, Where are the Jews? She would panic. Where? are the nine Jews you're hiding? And her first response was, we only have six. <laughs> they flipped the lights on. This guy is holding his head and said, no, it can't be that bad. And so they practiced and practiced and practiced over and over until one day a real raid came. And this time the knock was real. And the flashlight was from an SS troop. Where are the Jews? Tell me now. She said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he slapped her. Where are the Jews? She says, there aren't any Jews here. And she got thrown against the wall and hit a clock. I don't know what you're... And she got hit again. Where are the ration cards? And she got hit again. Before I could recover, she said, he slapped me again, then again, then again, stinging blows that jerked my head backwards. Where is the secret room? She said, I tasted blood in my mouth, my head spun, my ears rang, I was losing consciousness. Corey never gave up the location. She was arrested. And she was sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Her sister would die there. She, on the other hand, was released, but didn't find out as to why until 1959 that it was due to a clerical error. But a week after she was released, all women her age were executed. How was Corey able to do this? How could she have the faith in God that what she was doing was right, that he would fight her battles, and that she would protect him? She had the kind of faith we see in Hebrews 11. She knew God was not taken by surprise by this evil, and that she was called to simply be faithful and obey. Her faith was a working faith. Her faith trusted God in the fight, and that's the title of our sermon today. Would you pray with me? 
and we'll look at this narrative. Gracious Father, we come to you as a body of believers, a body of believers that is eager to hear the truth today, Lord, because we want this kind of faith. And I know that most feel like me that I could not muster this kind of faith that a young girl had. And yet, biblically, neither could she. Because faith is a gift, and it is by your grace that it is given. We are simply called to respond. We're simply called to take the Word of God that strengthens our faith by the power of God through His Holy Spirit and respond in faithfulness, in obedience. And so, Lord, we're excited to learn about these examples today of faithful Israelites in conquering the city of Jericho and a faithful Gentile, one from such a horrible background, and yet you redeemed her, Rahab, a woman for your own possession. Father, may we start this morning by thanking you, by glorifying you, by worshiping you deeply, for being so kind as to give us real flesh and blood examples of how we take the doctrine of these first ten chapters and we put it into practice with our faith. Lord, we don't know what the future holds, but we know things will get increasingly worse as your kingdom advances and as we near your son's return. And so I pray that you would equip us this morning, that you would equip us by the power of your word to not only understand what this kind of faith that trusts God in the fight, but that we would embrace it. We would delight in it. We would be desperately dependent upon you for it. And that we would not worry about what we will say in that moment, but that we will trust that you who have brought us thus far will carry us home. Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray today, Lord, I pray today for those who don't yet know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. For those who have yet, and we say yet because we have confidence that they will, those who have yet to repent of their sin and place their faith in Jesus Christ, may today be the day of their salvation. May they not leave here without being loved on by this congregation, without being witnessed to, without being invited to break bread, and may they be shared the good news of Jesus Christ. Open their hearts, open their minds, and may we hear the cries of newborn spiritual babes. Advance your kingdom through this church, Lord. We beg of you. We beg of you. Use us. You have saved us for a reason that we would be ambassadors. Let us see the fruit. Please, Lord, in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you're taking notes, and I would encourage you to do so, we're going to flip back and forth here. There are two points with these two verses. The first one, faith trusts God will fight our battles. Let me say that again. Faith trusts God will fight our battles. And secondly, faith trusts God will protect those who stand with Him. Faith trusts God will protect those who stand with Him. You think that this might be appropriate for this first century church that is full of Jewish believers living under the heel of Nero? I would say so. Let's look at the first one together. Faith trusts God will fight our battles. Verse 30 again, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Now, kiddos, we all know this story, right? We've, we've, we've seen it in our storybooks. We've seen it on the flannel graph. God has sovereignly ordained that this story has made it into this canon for a reason. And it's probably a lot more than what we've understood from Sunday school. 
So as we approach it, I want us to realize the transition that has just gone on. If you attend our equipping hour, you know that we're going through the books of the Bible. And so far we've been through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and today Numbers. By the time we get to Joshua, there is a transition of leadership. And so I want us to start in understanding this by imagining what it must have been like for Joshua. I don't imagine that it was easy. For 40 years, he had had a Moses, right? For 40 years, he had had someone to lean upon. He was the guy that didn't have to bear the burden. No one was really angry at Joshua during that time. And now he has to take over for this well-known, great, great man. It's ministerial suicide. It's like the guy who follows John MacArthur. You're always going to hear, well, John didn't preach that way. John wouldn't lead that way. I mean, if Joshua had a nickel for every time someone said, I don't think Moses would have done that. Moses never said it that way. You know, Moses had a more powerful presence than you did. I don't think you're doing it like... I think think Moses would be disappointed. Don't think he didn't get those comments. These were big, big sandals to fill. Secondly, we're out of this shepherding a a large flock of disobedient, stiff-necked people around the wilderness stage in life, and now we're to the conquest stage in life. And don't get me wrong, this was difficult. Getting people to trust where your next campsite is is not easy. But I'll promise you it's not as difficult as telling wives, yes, give me your husbands so that we can go fight a battle. And they say, my husband? The one who tends sheep? This guy's never even had a fist fight, and you're going to take him and and fight seasoned warriors? There's giants in the land, right? No, no, no. Joshua's he's got it tough. He's feeling the need for the kind of faith that trusts God for the fight rather than himself. And then there's no going back. I mean, the waters of the Jordan have closed behind them. And Jericho is before them. He remembers Jericho well. It is this imposing, fortified city. It is the first test of the Israelite army. He was there 40 years ago when he, along with the 11 other spies, what was the original Mossad sneaking around? They saw how tough it was, how fortified it was. They saw soldiers marching around It's only gotten more difficult the last 40 years. How were they supposed to penetrate these walls? Some of these walls in ancient Near Eastern cities were so wide that you could ride chariots atop them. These people were bigger than they were. They had more iron than they had. They had more implements. They had a standing army. They had a fortified city. Who does he have? Children of slave masons. What did your daddy do? He made mud bricks. What did you do? I walked around the desert for 40 years. Yeah, not exactly Navy SEALs. But it gets better, I would say, and worse. As Joshua is checking out the lay of the land, he sneaks around Jericho, I think most likely to decide from what angle he wants to attack. And then before him, as if, as if out of nowhere, a warrior stands before him with a drawn sword. No doubt Joshua advances, pulling his from his sheath and asking the question, are you for us or for our adversaries? It was an ancient Near East way of saying friend or foe. Turn with me back to Joshua chapter 5, and let's pick up on this story. Friend or foe? Look at verse 14. This impressive warrior says, No! 
Rather, I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. Are you with us or our enemy? No, I am a captain of the Lord's host. You know, the question was asked of Abraham Lincoln if he thought God was on the side of the Union. And I like his response. He said, Sir, my, not, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. And I kind of feel like that's what this guy is saying. No, no, Joshua, are you on our side? Now watch what happens. Verse 14, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. I agree with theologians. I think what we have here is what's called a theophany. That's where God Almighty, God who is a spirit, manifests himself as a man. Because Joshua bows down. He worships He's also called to remove his sandals. Does that sound familiar? His predecessor was called to remove his sandals at the burning bush where God explains that he is the great I am. That's the better part. That's the exciting part. You're meant to leave that narrative and understand that God is with Joshua as God has been with Moses. Amen? You know? If if Joshua needs to have faith that God will fight his battles for him, that's encouraging right there. God is with us. God is with me. God is with us like God was with Moses. That's the better part. Now the worse. Look ahead at Joshua chapter 6. God gives General Joshua the attack plan. He says, first, you're going to gather all your men. Now look at verse 3. And you shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. And I imagine Joshua interrupting and saying, good, good, good. And next we fire the catapults with the flaming balls of fire, and then we storm the castle, right? And he says, no, you're going to do this for six days. We're going to do what for six days? We're going to march around the city for six days. Yes, and there's more. During this time, you will have the priests with ram's horns, called the shofar, walk before the ark. And then we get to kill someone? I mean, this is a brand new sword I got here. No, you're going to do this for six days, and you are going to blow the horns, the shofars, at regular intervals. Okay, let me see here. We are going to conquer this city with Hebrew jazz. Is that what we're doing here? I'm not seeing it. I mean, I've been prepared 40 years to fight. We've got some some guys. They're not great warriors, but they've got a good heart. When are we going to attack the city? He says, well, on the seventh day, they're going to blow the the ram's horns for a long blast, and then you're going to shout like with this rebel yell. And then we attack the city. No. Then the walls fall flat. Yeah, I'm just not seeing how this is really going to work. You are meant to realize how absurd this is. We're so familiar with this story, we don't realize how absurd this is. This will not work. And now imagine them walking around, and the cat calls, and the laughter, and the tomatoes, and the garbage being thrown at them. This is embarrassing. And it's meant to be. Because faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God is making it clear that as he has preserved them under Moses' leadership for 40 years, now he will preserve them in the fight. So much so that he is going to fight their battle for them. And God's going to get all the credit. Amen? Do you think this Hebrew church needs to hear this story afresh? Do you think maybe the last time they heard it was when they were little kids in the synagogue 
and they need a preacher to give it to them in context of what a working faith looks like to trust God when there's giants in the land. Uh, I'm sure it brings to mind other great heroes of the faith. I mean, think, think, about, think about Israel's greatest warrior, also a shepherd boy turned soldier, David. David. Do you remember what David said when he would go up against the Philistines? Who, by the way, also controlled the use of iron, also had greater armaments, also were clearly bigger people, i.e., Goliath, right? Do you remember what he said? 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 19, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. David had a faith that asked, God, are you going to fight this battle for me? Because if not, I don't even want to enter it. And God says, yes, and it was a done deal. The evidence of things not seen. So as we heard last week, Joshua is called to move forward. And so he and his men obey against all worldly wisdom and against all military strategy, and they have a week of marching in silence, except for the blowing of ram's horns. Now look down at verse 20. There's not yet a sword drawn. There's not yet a bow that's been fired. Verse 20, chapter 6. So the people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. So that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. Now, if I'm a first century Hebrew Christian who's been drifting, who's tired of the persecution, who's tired of the tension, this is meant to encourage me. Because they too feel a little absurd sometimes. They too feel a little embarrassed. They too feel like that the world is mocking them and they are meant to trust that God will fight their battles against a much greater foe. They feel like the only weapon they have is the trumpet of God's Word. And yet in hearing the story, they're meant to rejoice and say, yeah, but it's the trumpet of God's Word. It's our obedience and faith in Him that changes things, that causes the battle to turn our way, because God is fighting it. They may not always see the victory, but they know that God is in the fight. And the same is true for us. 2 Corinthians 10.3, Paul writes, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And what we are meant to get out of this is what the first century church was meant to get out of this. And that is our fight begins and ends with our obedience. We are called to simply stand for the truth. We are called to simply be obedient and let God wield the sword and let God fight our battles. We are to do what is right consistently, even when it costs. Even when you're a young girl being slapped around by an SS troop, you do the right thing. And you trust that God will fight the battle spiritually where we cannot fight physically. We obey even when it seems absurd. Sometimes we'll see the walls fall. But you know, sometimes we just have to trust that they're in the process of crumbling by His divine hand. But what we don't have an option to do is disobey. 
Joshua did not, did not have the option to say, yeah, we're going to do this mostly. Or we're going to go ahead and send in a special team around the other side to infiltrate and fight and you know, take out the king and everything else. No. He was called to do it God's way so that God got all the glory. And, and I don't know about you, but I've, just, I've been having a lot of conversations lately with friends of mine. And, and this seems to be the, the reoccurring theme. Yeah, yeah, I know what the Bible says, and I totally believe that. But, you know, this situation is different, and I think you're just too black and white. I know what it says, and I know we're supposed to obey, but it's okay to not obey here. It's okay not to, not to do it there. It's okay not to stand here. And I'm not saying we always see everything right, but I'm sensing a softness, especially coming from pastors, a softness. Frankly, pastors, like everyone else, are tired of looking stupid. We're tired of being embarrassed by the world. We're tired of fighting a fight where our hands feel like they're tied behind our back. And yet God's got it rigged that way because He gets all the glory. Are we willing to stand for truth when we look stupid? I like this little poem here. Joshua trusted God to fight his way. His job was merely to obey. He led an impressive marching band without a sword drawn in hand. With the rebel yell, the walls did fall, and the battle won to the shock of all. Our job is to emulate the faith, the kind that stays, not runs in haste. What's really interesting, if, if we could just back up a little bit, we can see that our role is simply to obey. Trust and obey. If the kids were still here, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. And that's what this is about. That's what this is about. There's one other encouraging thing with this story that's easy to miss. The reason that congregation, that army of men who had never fought before was able to do this is that God also gave them a bit of encouragement. So we see the men of war marching, we see the priests marching, we see the trumpets, but the swords are in their sheath. But what else is with this band of men? The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. And what was the Ark of the Covenant representing? The presence of God, the presence of God. Now think about it, before Christ ascends, when he calls his men to advance his kingdom one soul at a time against all odds, how does he encourage them? And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. He encourages them with his presence. And so, Metro, are we standing for truth? Are we doing the hard things, the things that sometimes are embarrassing? Are we standing firm? Are we calling others to enlist under the captain of our salvation? And are we comfortable with being mocked on the march, knowing that God fights our battles? Well, look at our second point. Faith also trusts that God will protect those who stand with Him. God will protect those who stand with Him. You don't need to turn back there, but let me read to you verse 31. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Now, you also remember this story, but as you're in Joshua, go ahead and turn back just a couple of pages to chapter 2. Chapter 2. You know that the spies had gone into the city. They came to the house of Rahab. Pick it up in verse 2. It was told to the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you and who have entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. 
But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. Hmm, like a secret room. And she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they came from. Verse 5. It came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out, and I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. This is like a movie script, isn't it? A side note here, my seminary boys just had an assignment for this in their class. And the question on their discussion was, was Rahab wrong for lying to the king regarding the whereabouts of the spies? Have you ever struggled with this? You want me to give you the answer? No, I'm not going to do it. Actually, I am. Let me answer it this way. Was Corey Ten Boom wrong in lying to that Gestapo soldier about the whereabouts of the Jews in her home? No! I'm going to say it loud. No! And this is not situational ethics. This is called espionage. This is war. When we know the intent of God's enemy, we are bound by duty to protect the innocent. Period. This is not lying in this case. Hebrews makes it clear, and it juxtaposes Rahab directly against those who were disobedient. She is separated from the citizens of Jericho who wanted to kill them, and she protected them. She put her life on the line because her allegiance to the one true God was greater than her allegiance to the king. Why? Because the king sought to kill them. Look at chapter 2, verse 8. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and to Og, whom you utterly destroyed. By the way, Rahab is an Amorite. <laughs> Verse 11, when we heard of it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. beneath. So listen to her faith here. Let me just summarize it. I know that the Lord has given you this land, even though it hasn't happened yet. For... We have heard how the Lord did this, that, and the other. He is God, she says, in heaven above and on earth beneath. That's faith. Now, she doesn't have a deeply theological faith here, but she has faith, and she believes. And faith is a transfer of allegiance from protecting self, from serving the world, to bowing the knee to the one true God. And yet, how far outside the circle is she? How far outside the camp? Well, let's see. We've got Jews here inside the camp. We've got Gentile dogs outside the camp. We've got Gentile dogs who happen to be prostitutes outside that camp. And we've got Gentile dogs who are prostitutes who happen to be Amorites, a cursed people group, outside that camp who also happened to be part of a condemned city outside that camp. She's as far away as you can get. But God does what? Being rich in His mercy, with the great love with which He loved us, took His treasonous creation and brought us near by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, breaking down the two dividing groups into one. And now those who are far off have been brought near Don't tell me this is not a foreshadowing of us, Gentile dogs, prostitute, Amorites under the ban. Man, that'll preach. And she believes. She believes so much. Look at verse 12. She goes, now, therefore, I can imagine her pointing her bony finger at them. You swear to me now. 
You swear to me by the Lord that since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with my father's household. And give me your word. Give me a pledge of truth. And so the men said to her, verse 14, Our life for yours if, we do not te- if you do not tell this business of ours. And it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And they shook on it. And then she takes that faith and she moves forward in risk. She didn't say, yeah, I understand the first 10 chapters of Hebrews and it's so wonderful and I'm just going to sit here now. No, 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 no. She puts it all on the line and she risks. And she hides them. And then she lets them go out. 1 Peter 4, 19, Therefore, Those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. And I can imagine her, little girl that she is, holding that rope, letting them down the sidewall at night. She tells them to go and hide in the hill country for three days until the posse returns. And then they tell her this is going to be the secret sign when they come to conquer Jericho. Verse 17. We shall be free from this oath to you, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you tie this cord of a scarlet thread through the window through which you let us down. Now, I grew up hearing, you know, when you do that, the cartoons of the storybook, that the scarlet thread was red, and Jesus' blood was red. And so this is kind of, it's just really bad typology. Can I just say that? If you have that in your repertoire, don't teach our children that, okay? There's lots of Old Testament references to the, to the Messiah. We don't need to find Jesus behind every bush, okay? We need to be faithful. That said, I do think there is a legitimate connection here. And you have to ask yourself, if we're going to do typology, what would be a legitimate connection for the Israelites? Well, Francis Schaeffer makes a really good point here. If we're talking about a red cord or a sash hanging about the opening of a home, had the Israelites seen something like that before? He says, quote, When the children of Israel were about to leave Egypt... They were given the blood of the Passover lamb under which to be safe. When the people were about to enter the land, they were met by a different but parallel sign, a red cord hanging from the window of a believer. And I think that's a fair connection there. This home contains someone who is protected from judgment. Why? Because they believe that God is protecting them. And so she is protected because of her faith. Verse 22 of chapter 6, he tells the two men who spied out the land, you, you, go into the harlot's house and bring the woman and all she has out of there as you have sworn to her. Verse 25, Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all that she had, Joshua spared. Remember, Jericho was under the ban. Everything in it died. But she was spared in her household in the midst, and she has lived, watch this, circle this in your Bible, has lived in the midst of Israel to this day. Now that's a big deal. Remember? Prostitute, Amorite, uh, Gentile, town of Jericho, and yet she is part of the covenant community. This prostitute became a covenant child of Israel. She was grafted in. Matthew chapter 1, in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ, Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, another Gentile woman, a Moabite outside the camp. And Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of who? David the king. Now there's more here. Let me explain. Salmon, the guy she marries, okay, Rahab marries Salmon, was the son of Nashon. Now Nashon is talked about in number 7. 
Uh, and he was the one who offered his offering in the tabernacle on the first day. He was from the tribe of Judah, and he was a very well-respected man. He was the prince of Judah. And so he got to go and represent the tribe and offer his offering at the tabernacle when it was completed on the first day. This is her father-in-law now. She's marrying, marrying into nobility. A prostitute, Gentile dog, is marrying into nobility, into the tribe of Judah. Her grandson becomes... Uh, in, in, in King David, okay, King David's father, and the son of David, Jesus Christ, is in the line who sits on the throne of David. So when you read about Boaz, what do you need to remember? Mama Rahab. You can't read Ruth now without realizing Ruth is not the first Gentile grafted in. Does God protect His children? Even former Gentile dogs like us? You bet he does. How does he do it? Through a working faith. James 2.25, in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Faith is not, uh, James is not talking about you being saved by works. It's talking about how faith works. Faith produces. Genuine faith produces works. So let me leave this with this. What is our Jericho? It's not easy to answer. It may change day by day. It certainly changes generation by generation. But though the battle may change, our marching orders do not. We are called to obey God's Word even when it's embarrassing. And we obey God's Word knowing that He fights the fight for us and He will protect His children to the very end. And even like Paul said, even if death comes, what is death? What does it sting? Where does it sting? It's, it's, just, it's just a moment in time. We trust God for the results and for His protection. And if you say, well, I, but I don't know what God's will is in this case. That's it right there. It's the only will you need to understand. God's will is obeying His Scripture. God's will. Romans 12, 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Joshua, Joshua's faith was trusting God to fight the battle. Rahab's faith was trusting that God would protect her. This little Hebrew church in the first century is trusting God for both. And so do we. Amen. Amen.